But maybe we've just been listening to the wrong experts. Norman Fenton is the Professor of Risk Information Management at Queen Mary University in London. Hold that thought, risk, risk. Uh, because that's a word we've heard surprisingly little these last three years. Once upon a time, we took it for granted uh, that part of what it means to be a free-born citizen is that you're free to calculate risk for yourself. Oh, I want to cross the road, but, uh, oh, there's a car in the distance, but I have plenty of time to get across. Oh, no, hang on, he's accelerated. I'd better wait till he's gone by. Well, under the prevailing ideology in the Western world since February 2020, you will never get to cross the road at all. Professor Fenton joins me now. Uh, yeah, that word risk, there, you can see vague allusions to it in some of these emails that have been leaked uh, from, uh, well, governments in London. I, I think there's one email of Boris Johnson to Matt Hancock where he points out uh, the risks, the actual risks of this virus. Uh, we have upturned everything because nobody seems to have factored in risk. You're right. I mean, this notion of individualized risk benefit analysis was completely removed during the COVID era. Mm. And it's kind of like replaced by this lock stop approach, which was all about achieving zero COVID risk without taking any account of the costs involved. I mean, that's why we ended up with 99% of the population who were never at risk from COVID being locked down supposedly to protect the 1% at risk. Mm. And you know, what we've been doing for the last three years is showing that this was all driven anyway by flawed definitions and models and easily manipulated statistics that were always designed to mislead the public about risk. Now, when you say that, uh, I take it you're referring to uh, Professor Pants down at Imperial College and these kind of chaps who uh, I think the, their predictions for Omicron, which was totally harmless, their predictions for Omicron were that 600 people were going to die every day from it in the United Kingdom. How come uh, certain? How come he's an accepted expert, and uh, someone like you uh, doesn't get accorded the same treatment by the media? Oh, because it's all about certain academic elite. It's kind of like the uh, there's a sort of a leftist well, more than just a slight leftist uh, uh, bias in, 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 in all of those who, strangely, a conservative government mm. decided to appoint its, its advisors. But it's because that's the way academia works. They're, they are a kind of like a self-protected uh, elite, and they only recommend and promote the people who are kind of like sympathetic to that, that particular worldview. And it's not insane. It wasn't just... It's not so much that those models, these sort of imperial models. I think it goes much beyond that because the thing is that COVID was never anything like as lethal as was claimed. But it was things like mass testing of healthy people with the flawed PCR mm. test, which created enough so-called COVID cases and deaths to convince people that the effectively vaccines were the only way out. And then they used flawed methods and data, nothing to do with the imperial stuff but just simple flawed statistical methods to convince people that the vaccines were effective and safe when they were neither. And indeed, a lot of what we've been finding out about the flawed data is actually especially relevant to your Ofcom case. Well, I wonder if we will ever actually get accurate numbers. I mean, for example, people say if you, if you query vaccines on Twitter or Facebook, there's always someone in your feed within, uh, you know, three and a half minutes who said they've saved 20 million lives, these vaccines. Is there any actual evidence for that whatsoever? I mean, there's, there's no evidence of that whatsoever. I mean, the, the analogy I used on that, on that 20 million, it's like, imagine that I decide that I'm going to measure the, uh, the temperature every a few days of the outgoing on my garden, measure the temperature going from sort of January to the end of July. And what I actually see is that the temperature is kind of like edging up, sort of almost, you know, edging, edging up towards the end of July. And then I decide, well, hang on a sec, based on what I'm now observing, that data I'm observing, I'm predicting that by the end of the year, the temperature at the end of December is yeah. going to go up. You know, it's going to be like over 100 degrees. Yeah. Right? So what I'm going to do now is, is I'll, I'm going to take a, I'll take a portable fan and put it in my garden, hmm. right? And then observe what happens. And of course, suddenly 
the temperature, you know, after the end dry starts to go down again, mm. right? So I can now say it's a bit like saying, well, based on my um, based on my modelling, right? The mm. fact that I put that fan in the garden has now has now saved the saved the world from this sort of massive increase in temperature. Right. That's that's basically what they were doing with these predictions of well, these estimates of these twenty million lives lost. Yeah. They were using flawed models and then making these ridiculous inferences from them. And it's, it's of course impossible because there's no way. I mean, there's no way that many lives are lost. I mean, even on their own, even on their own figures, you know, they were talking that there was what about two million people um, died before the COVID vaccine. Mm. Suddenly, they how did they suddenly come up with a figure of twenty million saved after the vaccines were introduced? Mm. Nonsense. Do you think we will? When you say, "Oh, two million died before the COVID vaccines," and you know, we've we have all these anecdotal things. There was some chap, I think it was in Minnesota, who got thrown from a car and died but because he happened to test positive for covid that yeah. was put down as a covid death do you think we'll ever actually have an and we now see for example that the median age of covid deaths in england and wales is something like five or six years beyond uh, a life expectancy in england and wales uh, i mean to come back to your word risk and, and what you do at Queen Mary University, in what sane world do you tank the global economy for something uh, that kills people who are five or six years older than average life expectancy? Well, you don't. And this, uh, I should say that I officially retired from Queen Mary mm. at the end of 2022, mm. but I'm still emeritus professor. Mm. Um, but uh, they're you know, all they, the best these days. They're all the best ones because they're the they're, exactly, you're, that, that, you're that, one that, of the last non woke professors in the Western world is. is that, that's, uh, exactly. It, that's, it, that's the only reason why I can actually speak up about uh, these things. And of course, <laughs> it contributes, mm. of course, partly to the reason why I'm uh, yeah, no longer there. But there mm. are other personal reasons. But yeah, I mean, the, the risk, this whole notion, exactly the, 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 the risk. It's, I mean, it's, it, it's crazy, isn't it? There was never never any justification as i said they were never never taken account of the, the actual costs of these you know the the various implementation measures not just the lockdowns but the enormous cost of the you know of the vaccine program I mean, what a complete waste you know it, it, what a complete waste i mean it's just just ridiculous i mean just a, a, an amusing anecdote actually i found that i, I heard that in did you know that in colombia apparently they were offering 800 dollars for unvaccinated blood a, a pint <laughs> So you're going to get this situation soon that the the vaccinated mm. will be kind of like looking to get fake certificates to, to prove that they're unvaccinated. Mm, yeah. so, but I mean, yeah, this it's, it's it's all nonsense. No, no, and they're going to be like vax. Uh, they're going to be like vaccine vampires. They're going to be pouncing on vaccine virgins in in remote uh, villages in Carpathia, and uh, and using them for their blood transfusions and and things. Are you so go, going on to your point? You're yeah. going on to your point about again about this data and about the the how the way they were defining, you know, cases that mm. you know everybody was basically. I mean, it was worse in America. I mean, in America, in the UK, it was anybody who tested positive on this flawed PCR test within uh, 28 days of, of dying was classified as a COVID death, and also classified as a hospitalisation. All those hospitalisation data, they were all flawed, as as were you know everything else was driven by this fake definition of what a, a COVID a COVID case was, and. Um, then you've got the so you've got that problem with the data but then you've got the kind of like the official office of national statistics data that is all based on an extremely biased subset of the england population which most people don't realize it was based on those who were registered in the 2011 census who were also registered with the gp in 2019 and that missed out over 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 10 million adults who were a very different demographic to those who were in the ons sample and it meant for example that their estimate of only 8% adult unvaccinated, for example, last May, mm. was wrong. We've got solid evidence that the real figure was over 20%. In fact, the statistics regulator even agreed with us on that. And the key thing is, if you underestimate, as they did, the proportion of the unvaccinated, what it does is then it exaggerates all the efficacy and safety figures in favour of the vaccines. Yeah. And of course, it was also used to claim that the unvaccinated were disproportionately being hospitalised with COVID. That yeah. what we actually know is that it was it was the vaccination which was causing the increased 
COVID rates. You know, the, those so-called second wave didn't start until the vaccination program ramped up. No. And that's, you know, that's when, the, that's when the, there were a lot more COVID cases. But I think that's actually a, a, a critical point of yours, that, uh, that officialdom still, in, still underestimates the proportion of the population that's unvaccinated yeah. uh, by about, uh, I think if I'm doing my arithmetic correctly, by about 60%. As you say, it's, it's, uh, they say it's 8 million and it's more like over 20 million. What's, what's, yeah, it's 8% rather than 20%, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what, what's, uh, what's behind, what's behind the relentlessness of the propaganda? I mean, this is, this is what is so bizarre. Uh, you know, Naomi Wolf's theory is that, you know, in a certain sense, these people are complicit in a great crime. And if that is the case, then you need to keep the crime covered up because the minute you back off it, it's all going to crumble. But some of this monkey business was going on even before people started dying from the vaccine or getting injured from the vaccine. Uh, this one size fits all pro propaganda. Yeah, because I thought it was, I mean, I always said that the the COVID lockdowns were the inevitable precursor for the climate lockdowns. And it all mm. fits into that, you know, WF, uh, mm. UN Agenda 2030 idea of, you know, zero, uh, uh, zero carbon. You've got the perfect analogy. We go from zero COVID to zero carbon. But of course, the zero carbon, you know, plan was always there before. And it's, you know, it's this move towards, you know, this this sort of, you know, what new world order, the, the sort of the new global economy. And, you know, the COVID lockdowns were, you know, were kind of like a dry run for what they're planning with these, you know, the 15 minute cities and all of the other nonsense that are part of that, um, you know, zero carbon agenda, 2030 agenda. And, um, you know, that, that, that's why they have to keep that. They have to keep up this. I think I always thought that, that a key component of that was going to be the kind of the idea that the if you were going to move part of that was going to be the idea the movement towards a digital ID, an international digital mm. ID. And if you wanted to actually implement that, I think that having vaccines mandated and kind of like registered it as part of that digital ID was always, you know, was always a critical component of it. And so they have to create this. Um, not only do they have to drive people to this you know, to, 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 the, to get the vaccinations, but they have to create this impression that the only people who are not vaccinated is some kind of tiny fringe minority. Right, right, and and uh, you know, and uh, then uh, the government in uh, you know the Canadian government demonizes the unvaccinated as racists. And yeah. uh, and and Monsieur Macron in Paris says they're not even citizens. And then uh, whichever German minister it was says they're enemies of the state. It's it's uh, it's it's so obvious in a way that uh, and you've seen it in so many crappy conspiracy movies. You you wonder why people are actually falling for it in real life. Thank you very yeah. much, uh, Norman. It is uh, it is great to see you. And uh, that's the view. That's been our. Norman and Nami show the view from both sides of the Atlantic on where we stand on this right now. But don't go anywhere because we are coming right back in just 30 seconds.